I'm excited to share the message with you. Uh, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 1. We're kicking off a new series today uh, in the book of Galatians that will lead us right up uh, into Easter. Um, and kind of the, the title of our, our series is Set Free to Live Free. Uh, that's what we hope to do, and uh, we've been set free in Christ, and so uh, that's what we are pursuing. Um, but there's a common uh, misconception in Christianity that the gospel is really just for an introduction into Christianity. Once you have that salvation moment, uh, the gospel is now past you. And now you need to advance into to deeper teaching and, and, and to grow and to learn more. And so the gospel is that initial introduction to Christianity, then you move on from there. But uh, my uh, preface for this entire message and uh, us as a church and what we believe is that the A to Z of Christianity, the, the first to last thing, everything that encompasses Christianity starts and ends with the gospel. It is essential to our daily life. We can't uh, live and breathe and have our being without the gospel being the core of who we are. Now, you might be sitting there being like, well, what is he talking about? Because the gospel is also a term that's thrown around a lot, right? We use it to describe the first four books of the New Testament. We use it to describe uh, the, 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 the death and resurrection of Christ and so on and so forth, right? It's a, a term that's thrown around, gospel-centered, all of that, right? And so I have a, a, a summary of what I mean by the gospel, definition, so to speak, and it's this. The gospel is the message that we are more wicked than we ever dared to believe, and that we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared to hope. We're more wicked than we ever dared to believe. No one likes hearing that, right? No one walked into church saying, gosh, I hope pastor says I'm wicked today. <laughs> but that we're more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared to hope. That is the, the motivation of the gospel. That is what dictates our daily life and our daily choices, right? But it also creates in us this, this radical love, the, the, this radical uh, um, obedience to who Jesus is, and it also creates in us a hope, right? If we are more wicked than we can even fully comprehend, and yet God still loves us and chooses us, that's going to motivate us in a certain way, right? That's going to motivate us. And if you've ever been in, in a loving, caring relationship, whether with a, a father and a mother or a husband and a wife or a boyfriend, girlfriend, however, even a, a friend to a friend, right? In that loving environment, right, you're willing to go so much further than you would just for anybody else. Why? Because there is a shared love there, right? And so my hope for us today is that we see the centrality of the gospel, the centrality of this very message in our daily life, right? And not just that one-time salvation prayer that we pray. But we, we, we're rooting it in the book of Galatians. And the, the book of Galatians is unique because Paul starts off by uh, highlighting that it's not a work-based salvation. Right? Anybody that says you have to do X, Y, and Z for Christ to love you and for Christ to accept you and for you to earn salvation is not actually preaching the gospel. They're preaching heresy. Right? And so if they're saying to you, you have to dress a certain way, you have to live a certain lifestyle or a certain standard, you have to attend church or you have to tithe, right? Some of these things are things that we do, but if they're how you earn your salvation, it's not actually the gospel, it's heresy, right? And so for us, if we're going to root ourselves as a church in the foundation of the word, we have to understand what the gospel truly is. And so what, what Paul is saying to us in the book of Galatians is, hey, you are only saved one way and one way only, which is faith in Christ and what he did. Everything else we do, all of the works that follow, every single action that we do, every single choice that we make, every single word that we speak, right? The lifestyle that we live, all of that is just a fruit of our faith in Christ, right? The whole idea of fruits of the Spirit comes later in Galatians, right? He's saying, hey, these, these are what your life should look like, right? We're not saying that we shouldn't have a, a standard or a hope of what our life looks like, but that is not what earns us our salvation. And I'll make this as my final argument why it's important to talk about the gospel, not just as a salvation, but as an everyday uh, believing uh, believer to reflect on. Who is the audience to this letter? The audience is the church at Galatia, a.k.a. a bunch of fellow Christians. So if Paul is writing to a bunch of Christians and starts with his very first thing saying, hey, this is the gospel, it means that no matter how long you've been walking with Christ, 
which I think in this room is probably my parents, right? No matter if you've spent literally decades or this is your first 10 minutes of being introduced to Christianity, all of us need this message. All of us need to be reminded why because sometimes we get self-righteous and think, oh, I've attended church enough. I've done my part. The Lord needs to bless me. It's my turn, right? I've earned this, and now I get to be judgmental towards others because they haven't made the choice. They haven't chosen to accept Christ. Even that language makes it on us. I'll just let that sink in for you, right? We, we throw around phrases and words all the time. Oh, you have to invite Jesus into your heart as if we have something to do with it. Right? The very heart and hope of the gospel is that you can do nothing in yourselves. Right? That your salvation is earned through Christ. But let, let's look at the context. So we said it's a, it's a letter to Galatia. That's what our, our, our book is. Um, Paul planted churches all over the place. He was a little church planting machine, which to me, now that I've been in church planting, uh, pushing eight years now, which is even crazy to think about as a number, man, that's exhausting. I don't know how he did it. But that, that has nothing to do with our message, right? So how did Paul stay in touch with the churches? Well, he would FaceTime them regularly, and I'm just kidding. Obviously, he didn't have FaceTime, right? And travel was a little bit slower, right? There was no, forget about airlines, there wasn't even Amtrak, right? Um, So what did he do? He wrote letters. He would hear about what was happening. Sometimes people would visit him, even visit him in prison, and then he would write letters. And so that's where we get this letter to the Galatia church, which was in Asia Minor. All of that, I'm sure you're you're excited to learn today, right? Uh, Anyway. Uh, the first Christians were Jewish, right? Christianity started in Jerusalem, but when Paul is writing this, something unique has happened, which is the church has exploded, and for the first time in its history, Gentiles are equal to or outnumbering Jewish folks, and so it created this tension. And so Paul is writing to this church at Galatia to address racial and cultural issues that were arising, one of which, which is, what does it mean to actually be a Christian? Right? Because up until that point, if you were Jewish, you had a certain culture. You had a certain way of dressing. You had a certain food and dietary uh, approach to life. And so just putting your faith in Christ didn't really change much of your actual culture. For the first time, though, it's becoming a multicultural expression, and that creates tension. Right? Anybody that's ever been in a multicultural setting, and if you're, you're unsure about this church, just look around. We're in a multicultural setting. Right? Sometimes tension arises in culture. What does it actually mean? And so Paul is getting to the heart of this. But the main issue that he's addressing in our passage today is that teachers began to teach that you needed to follow the historical ceremonial mosaic law, right? You had to follow the dietary restrictions. You had to follow uh, the certain dress clothes. You had to follow circumcision. I won't go into detail on that element, right? But he is saying something different. And so that's our passage. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 to 9 is where we're going to be reading. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to, diver- uh, trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. That's a little daunting as I get ready to preach, right? (laughs) Let's pray. Lord, would you be in the midst of us? Would we see the beauty of your gospel? Maybe like we've never seen it before, God. And no matter how long we've been walking with you, may we see the beauty of your salvation and what you're offering to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So if you are familiar with Paul's letters, uh, you might catch something in the very opening of Galatians that's unique. It has a different tone than some of his other letters. See, think of mind, he, it's his first time talking uh, to his church in a while, so he might want to be loving and glowing, and that's what a lot of his letters open up with, right? It opens up with a greeting section, usually the first couple verses, and then it switches to a section of thanksgiving, right? Uh, thanksgiving for those he's writing to, thanksgiving for the church and its leaders, right? 
Uh, you see it in Philippians 1, 3 to 8. You see it in Colossians 1, 4 to 9. You see it in 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9, right? So he's, he has this pattern of being loving and glowing, even if he's about to smack them across the head for what they're doing, right? And so that's his opening. But with Galatians, it's got a little different tone. He opens with strong language, right? I am astonished, right? Why is he talking to the church at Galatia with astonishment? It's because they've abandoned the very gospel that they put their faith in. And he's astonished that so quickly they could move aside, that they could be taken back by a different message. They've forgotten the very core of what their identity is, which is the hope in Christ. So I got two points today, and they they blend together. The first is this. The gospel is revolutionary. It's unique. And it's the only thing that actually creates heart change in us. It's the gospel. It's not my oratory abilities. It's not uh, someone else's gift of persuasion. There's only one thing that creates lasting heart change, and it's the gospel. And I would argue here today that the gospel is unique and it's revolutionary compared to any other faith practice, compared to any other religion. So Let's start with what is the gospel, right? I gave you my definition, but Paul gives you a a nice, concise version of what the gospel is in verses 3 to 5. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'll answer what is the gospel by giving you a nice little three-part answer, which is who we are, what did Jesus do, and why did God do it, right? Who we are, what did Jesus do, and why did God do it? So who we are, we're helpless and lost, right? Simply put, we are helpless and lost. No matter how successful you are, no matter how much time you've devoted to your degrees and to your place of employment, all of us in our very core being, when it comes to our spirituality, are actually just helpless and lost, including yours truly in front of you. If you're looking for a church that has perfect pastors, me and Lipe will give you recommendations because this is not it, right? We got to be honest and transparent. All of us are helpless and lost in and of ourselves, right? Which is why in verse 4, when he's talking about the gospel, he uses a very key word, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us. We're in need of rescue, Right? That is who we are to our core beings, right? The founders of every other religion came to teach. The founder of Christianity came to rescue. That's what distinguishes Christianity. Think about what Paul is saying here. Paul gives you a synopsis of three years of Jesus' life. Most of the Gospels are con- uh, uh, cultivating moments of Jesus' teaching and Jesus' miracles. He mentions neither, right? He mentions neither. The core of what many people think Jesus is, which is a great moral teacher, has nothing to do with what Paul is saying the gospel is about. The core of what Jesus came to do is that he came to rescue us, right? You're not a Christian because you're a follower of Jesus' teaching. If you thought that was what being a Christian is, try to live out the Sermon on the Mount this week. I challenge you. If you're unfamiliar with the Sermon on the Mount, he says, <laughs> you've heard it said, do not commit murder. I tell you, do not have anger in your heart. If you've ever driven in rush hour in Jersey City, you've had some hatred and anger in your heart, right? Do not commit adultery. That's what you've heard it said. I tell you, do not have lust in your eyes. If you've ever been on the internet for more than five minutes, you're going to find some lust, even if you're not looking for it. Is that too true, gentlemen? So the core of the gospel is not actually following Jesus' teaching. You are a Christian solely because you acknowledge and accept the work of Jesus Christ and the grace that he provides you. That is the foundation of who we are, right? You cannot rescue yourself unless you, I'm sorry, you cannot need rescue unless you are in a hopeless and a lost state, unless you are in a helpless condition. And I have a wonderful story that is going to make some of you laugh. So summertime, I have the best job in the world. I think I have the best job in the world most times of the year. Um, But particularly summertime, I get paid primarily to go sailing. Now, I would go toe-to-toe with any of you during your job in the summer, because unless you're getting to go sailing, I think I got you beat, right? But anyway, (laughs) this one morning, it's a beautiful morning, I bike down to the marina. I'm in my work clothes, a.k.a. dress pants and shoes and a button-down, and I go sailing just as a training sailing in the morning with my coworkers Sue and Diana, right? There is no intention to get anything crazy. It's just to practice a few maneuvers, and then we're going to go back into the marina. Well, 
as we're coming back into the marina, we have a lovely sail. Nothing happens. All the sails are down. We're motoring in. We come close to the dock, and I get ready to step off. Sue is uh, guiding the boat with the engine, and I get ready to step off. And sailing 101 when docking, we're actually boating 101 when docking, is you always touch something that's solid, a.k.a. that's not going to move on you, right? A, 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 a stanchion, a, a shroud, those are things on the boat that don't move, that let you hold on in case you lose your balance. Well, I don't know what I was thinking, but I get the brilliant idea that I step over the lifelines, which is what keeps you in the boat. So now I'm on the edge of the boat, and I decide I'm not going to hold on to anything solid, right? And as Sue turns into the dock, I somehow lose my balance. I swing around. I'm literally holding on, but I have a big frame, and my momentum, I was going in the water, and I was sunk. And so I literally fall into the water, somehow keep my Apple Watch and my head mostly above water, getting my mask wet with dirty Hudson Marina water. Uh, yeah, I know. It was, it was disgusting, right? And now I'm in the water while a boat full of like eight fishermen see me as they're fueling their boat and begin to laugh. So I'm utterly mortified, right? Now in that moment, if Sue started talking to me about proper boating technique and proper docking technique, that would not help me in my current situation. If he threw me a manual on how to stay afloat in water, also would not help me in that moment. What I needed in that moment was for him to actually reach down his hand and to pull me out of that disgusting water. And so when we as a church think that we need to teach people a certain way, that we need to sit down and really divulge what the scripture says to them, instead of saying, hey, Christ came to just rescue you, to give you a hand out of your situation, to actually rescue you from the worst thing that you could possibly imagine because he loves you, that's the hope of the gospel. Nothing in who we are, nothing that we can possibly do can earn us the salvation that we so desperately need. So yes, Jesus is a teacher, and it is important to follow his teaching. That is not what I'm saying here today of like, just throw it all out. We don't need any of it, right? What I'm trying to tell you is that if you think following his teaching long enough will earn you salvation, we've missed the mark in teaching you what the gospel is. The gospel is that he is our rescuer. So that's who we are. We are a broken, helpless, lost people in need of rescue. But what did Jesus do? Verses 3 and 4, Paul already told us. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. That word for, F-O-R, right? Small little three-letter word in the English. But in verse 4, it means on behalf of or in place of. Right? Christ's death was not just this general sacrifice. It was a very specific sacrifice, and it was one that was substitutionary for you. It took the place of what we all deserved. So when I'm talking about the, the gospel being revolutionary, it's revolutionary because Jesus gave himself for each and every one of us. That's what the gospel is all about. The uh, substitutionary uh, exchange that Jesus did that we all needed but couldn't do on our own. But let's, let's keep moving. Why, why did God do it, right? The third part of what I was saying in, in identifying the gospel. Why did God do it? Verses 4 to 5 told us, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God did it out of his grace. Not because of anything we did. He didn't go on the cross because he knew one day you would walk into a church and it would connect for you and you would decide to live for him. He didn't go to the cross because he knew you would be a good tither and that you would volunteer your hours. He simply went to the cross on his own according to his very will as God the Father. That's why he went. God in his grace planned for our rescue. When we didn't even realize it, that we needed it. Guess what? When I fell in the marina, I knew I needed it. I knew there was an engine running. I knew there was God only knows what floating in that water, right? I needed to get out of that water, right? But for many of us, we didn't even realize we needed the salvation. Even when we accepted Jesus, we didn't probably fully comprehend the, the brokenness and the depth of our depravity. But that same grace completed our rescue, which we couldn't do on our own. So salvation is utterly and completely God's willing. It's his calling. It's his plan. It's his action. It's his work, which is why Paul says that he deserves the glory forever and ever. 
not us. That's the hope of the gospel, that we are far more wicked than we could have ever think or imagine, but that we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared to dream. So the gospel, it's revolutionary, it's unique, it's the only thing that can create heart change in us. But we have a fundamental problem. And this is leading us to our second point. Our fundamental problem is we like to be our own saviors. Right? We, we love movies about self-saving, right? William Wallace. I'm a big Braveheart fan. I know, I'm Irish. It just, it's natural. Men in kilts. It's my kind of thing. St. Patty's Day this week. I know. Who's cooking some good corned beef? Oh, yeah. If you want a tip, you slow cook it in beer, uh, and then you let it cook for five, six hours, and you pull it out and broil it for like 20 minutes. <sighs> Slamming. Anyway, that was not in my notes. Um, <laughs> we have a fundamental problem, right? We love to be our own saviors, right? We, we could see this in a religious setting, right? We, we find messages of self-salvation very attractive, Right? Religious elements of it is, hey, if you keep these rules, then you will earn eternal blessings, right? And if you've come from a legalistic church background, you know that mantra very well, right? You just got to keep these rules, and that's how you will be blessed. It becomes about self-salvation and not of actually the message of the cross. Or you could go the other way, the secular way, which is, hey, if you just grab hold of these things, then you will experience blessings now. Right? Just take hold of it. Make your own choices, and you'll find that self-satisfaction. So this is our, our second point, right? We saw that the gospel is this unique, revolutionary thing that creates heart change. But the second thing is that the church has always done this, and it will continue to do this, which is to be tempted to create our own gospel. It's always been tempted. Before Christ even showed up, read the Old Testament. Man, every time the people of Israel would get away from what God was calling them to, right? It's just part of who we are since the fall of Adam and Eve to want to create our own salvation. What did Adam and Eve do? They made their own fig leaves. Let's just try to cover it up, right? It wasn't until God showed up and gave them a covering that they were forgiven. And so we're, we're tempted by this, right? We, we began by highlighting that Galatians had a little bit of a different tone, than Paul's other letters, right, that he had written. So let's reread what he's saying, why it gives it that different tone. Verses 6 to 9, and this is our section that we'll close with. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and this is a key phrase, and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As you've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. The word pervert there in verse 7, it means reverses means a, a 180. There you go, Scott. I did the right math on that one. That's for you. 360 means you start, you start back where you start. Anyway, Scott will give you your lessons later uh, during some, some hospitality time, right? In the context of what Paul's addressing here, he's saying, hey, your teachers are telling you you got to keep the uh, a, a ceremonial mosaic law, right? But that is actually perverting and reversing the very gospel, Right? The heart of the gospel is that you put your faith in Christ, not that you follow these following rules to actually earn your salvation. Right? Uh, another way of saying it is that if we add anything to Christ and his message right, as a requirement for our salvation, we're completely reversing the order of the gospel. It sounds something like this. This sort of teaching is to be saved, you need the grace of Christ. Plus blank. But by adding that, that simple plus these things, you're making the gospel null and void. Right? All you need to be saved is the grace of Christ and right beliefs and right behaviors. You might be like, wait, what? 
Right beliefs and right behaviors are a product of your salvation. They are not what earns you your salvation. All you need to be saved is grace and Christ and to be intolerant of others who are different. All you need to be saved is the grace of Christ and to wear the proper dress attire in church. I shared it last week during Growth Trek. If a woman walks in in a miniskirt, you know what's going to be told to her? Welcome. Have a seat. That was not what was said in my church growing up. Here's a blanket. Cover up your legs. If you're sitting in a skirt in the front row, make sure you cover up because you might cause the, the pastor to lust from the stage. How dare we pervert the gospel by adding anything to it? Guess what? If someone walks through the doors of the church, do you know the conviction that brought them here? If a gay or a lesbian couple comes in holding hands, guess what? They don't need our stance. They already know what the majority of churches believe on their lifestyle. What they're coming for is Christ. And I am not going to be a hindrance for them to experience the grace and the beauty of who Christ is. That doesn't mean that we don't hold standards. That doesn't mean that we don't believe for better things in people's lives. What it means is that ultimately the salvation is not about us and our comfortabilities and what we would want people to look like or act like. It's about pointing them to the cross. All we need to be saved is the grace of Christ and to submit to our pastoral authority. Man, how many have grown up into a church? Brother, you just need to submit to what I said. I'm the set man. God forgive us. There's beauty in having church structure and church order. Paul talks about it, right? We're a church that believes in that. We're a church that believes in accountability. But if, God forbid, ever from this pulpit, we say that you need to adopt what we believe as part of your salvation, we have missed the mark. All we need to be saved is the grace of Christ and just to hold some of these legalistic views. And the list goes on. All we need to be saved is the grace of Christ and to hold to this political party's views and all of their issues on certain topics, Republican or Democrat. Take that as you will. There are plenty of churches that say, hey, in order to be saved, these are the things you need. Faith in Christ and this. But Paul tells us that's not the gospel. The moment that we revise the gospel, the moment that we add a single morsel to it, the moment that we add a clause to it, we don't just not avoid it, we reverse it. We do the opposite of what it was intended to do. But Paul makes this example even a little bit crazier. And we'll close with this. Verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel... Paul's saying, hey, if I show up on the scene again and I've changed it, and now all of a sudden it's faith by works, throw me out. I'll go even further. If an angel comes down from heaven itself and says salvation is by works, kick that angel out. All I know is if an angel shows up, I'm going to be a little freaked out. I'm sure all of you will be too, right? (laughs) So what Paul is saying is that no apostle, no pastor, no preacher, no teacher, no a credential of any sort can pervert the gospel in any way. If they do, kick them out. Don't listen to them. They're perverting the very gospel that you've learned. We cannot add anything to the message of Christ. What a preacher says from the pulpit is not a result of his study. It's not a result of his research. It's not a result of his reflection or his wisdom. If a message from a preacher from a pope, whether me, Lipe, or anybody else, if it's actually rooted in Scripture, if it's actually true to what Scripture says, it is God-given, and it is unchangeable, and it is unchanging. That means sometimes that what Scripture says is hard in our current context. I realize that. Sometimes Scripture calls us to a standard that isn't cool anymore, that doesn't jive with our culture, that makes us stand out for our beliefs. But ultimately, the gospel is not about anything else other than our faith and our hope in who Jesus is. The gospel is revolutionary. The gospel is unique. It's the only thing that creates our change. So let us avoid that temptation to make our own saviors. Let's pray. 
Lord, help us to live out the gospel. Lord, forgive us if we viewed the gospel as just that salvation moment. That moment where we say a prayer at the end of a service or in our bedroom, but now we've moved on to more advanced things. Lord, make the gospel central to our hearts. Make the gospel central to our minds. May we always think about it and reflect on it because we realize those around us need to hear it now more than ever. May our lives reflect the beauty of the gospel, not a legalistic standard, but the beauty of who you are. Lord, help us as we are tempted to create other saviors, including ourselves. Forgive us for thinking that we have somehow earned our salvation. Forgive us for judging others whose eyes have not yet been opened to the beauty of who you are. And may we stop being a finger pointer to judgment, but be a finger pointer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.